tried to kidnap her. Mm. She says she fought him off and he shoved her off the running board and in front of another car. Mm. Where did this happen? Six and Temple. The doctors at the hospital say that she'll lose the sight of her right eye. I feel sorry for the kid. Yeah, it's too bad. You got a line on the car? Yes, a motorman got the license number. Here it is, sir. Mm. J23416. Let me call that in. Yes, sir? Uh, put a pickup out in the road, sir. Uh, what is the color? Blue. Uh, Blue Roadster, license J23416. J23416. That's it. Right. Go ahead, Drake. What is the girl's name? Florence Williams. She works in one of the South Side dance halls. I think it's the Bluebird. Mm -hmm. Taxi dancer. No. She looks like a pretty clean kid, Captain. Sells tickets. Only been working there a month, she said. Did she know this guy who tried to kidnap her? Not by name. She said that he'd been in the dance hall several times. Hmm. And she'll be able to identify him if we pick him up. Yeah, she said that she would. Did you notify her family? Yeah. Her mother and father are at the hospital with her now. Do you realize, Drake, that this makes the fifth case of this type this month? Yes, sir. We've got to get this fellow and make an example of him. Yes, sir. You know, you've got full charge of the case, Drake. Run him down, and when you get him, bring him to me. Yes, sir. Yes? There's a young fellow here to see you, Captain. Yeah, what's he want? He says he wants to see you about his sister. Name is Williams. Oh, Williams, huh? Uh, all right, send him in. The girl's brother. Yeah, he probably just found out about it. Yeah? Captain Wade? Yeah, over there, son. What are you going to do about my sister, Captain? Well, what can we do about it? What can you do about it? You can get the dirty skunk that threw her out of his car. That's what you can do. What are you paid for? What are you doing to earn no, your money? No, no, no. Just a minute, young fellow. What's your name? Bob Williams. My sister was the one who yeah, was... Yes, yes, we know. Uh, do you know who the fellow was? No, but if I ever get my hands on the dirty snake, I'll kill him. Oh, That's no. what I'll do. No, I'll wait, kill him like a little lazy dog. Wait a minute now, son. Control yourself. Well? We're doing everything we can to find this man. And when we do, uh, he'll be dealt with according to the law. And this state has a pretty stiff penalty uh, for kidnapping. According to law. If he's got any sort of a pull, you won't have him in jail ten minutes. Yes? Well, I've just got the registration report on that car from the motor vehicle department. You had it? Yes. Who's it registered to? An Italian. Ernesto Savoldi. Who? Wait a minute. Uh, Who did you say the car was registered to? Ernesto Savoldi. S-A-V-O-L-D-I. Okay. All right, pick him up. Well, what'd you start for, kid? You know this Savoldi? No. 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 I don't know him. Are you sure? Sure, I'm sure. I thought I did it first, but, well, I guess I got him mixed up with someone else. Uh Well, we'll get him, son. If your sister identifies him, it'll go hard with him. All right, thanks. That's a promise, kid. Thanks. Uh, that boy was certainly a wild one, wasn't he? Yeah. Well, you can't blame him much. You know this, Savoli? Yeah, I think so. 
I'll bet a month's pay is the same for Foley that was in here a month ago for beating and robbing that blind man. Oh, do you think so? Yes, sir, I'm pretty sure. Yes? Which one of you is Captain Wade? Why? Oh, so you're Captain Wade. Well, I'm Frank Williams, brother of the girl who was injured this evening. And I demand that you do say, something. Say, listen, what are you trying to pull? What do you mean? You were just in here and I told you that we'd do all we could. You're crazy. Now, listen here, young fellow. I'm not going to stand for any foolishness from you. We'll do what we can, and I don't want you running in here every two minutes. But this is the first time I've been oh, in wait here. wait a minute. What did you say your name was? Frank Williams. Oh, I see. My brother's been here before me. Your brother? Yes, we're twins. This isn't a gag, is it? Not at all. Oh, don't worry, Captain. If our folks can't tell us apart, I can hardly expect you to. Well, what's been done? Wait a minute. Let me get this straight. You're, uh, you are Frank Williams. Right. And you've got a twin brother named Bob, huh? That's right. And nobody can tell you apart? Mother says she can, but we're not so sure of it. Even she slipped up now and then. Mm -hmm. Well, that's one for the book. Well, what's been done to find the man who tried to kill my sister? Well, he's placed the car to a fellow named Savoldi. Savoldi? Yeah, Ernesto Savoldi. Do you know him? No, no, I don't know him. Are you sure, kid? Certainly I'm sure. Well, don't worry, I've got a detail out on him now. We'll have him inside of 24 hours. You can bank on that. Then what? If he hires a clever lawyer, he'll be beat the charge. Well, that's what your brother said, but don't worry. We'll do our best to make it stick, and I know the district attorney will, too. He's making a drive on these cases that have happened lately. All right, thanks. So long, kid. I hope I never meet you both in another dark alley. I'll probably think I'm seeing things. <laughs> Savoldi and the girl identified him. We took him down to the hospital, and she almost went crazy when she saw him. And then this guy produces seven witnesses who say that he wasn't even in his car that night. Well, what about it? Did you check up on him? Yeah, liars, that's all. A whole rotten pack of liars. And they're all willing to go to the stand and swear that Savoldi wasn't even outside the Red Domino parlor. Well, that's all that we can do. We've got Savoldi in jail, and it's up to the D.A. to make the rap stick. Uh, you mean we did have Savoldi in the jug? Uh what do you mean? He's out, that's what. Oh. There was a lawyer down before they sold doors closed to the writ of habeas corpus. <laughs> the Voldy didn't even get as far as the jailer said. Uh, how long has he been out? All afternoon. It's in the afternoon papers. No, uh, I didn't. Take the bureau, Captain Wade. What? Oh. No. All right, I'll be right out. What now, Captain? One of the Williams twins just lured Savoldi out in the open and filled him full of lead. Savoldi's debtor in last year's Congress. <laughs> All right, now, Mrs. Fink, tell us everything, just as you saw it. Well, I was sitting on the fire escape. The day was awful hot, you know, when I see this young man go into the domino parlor. Mm -hmm. That looks like an awful nice young man, I say to myself, to be going into such a place. Then all of a sudden, he comes out followed by a dark Italian-looking man. When they reach the center of the street, boy, give out. The boy turns around, pulls out a gun, and shoots the other man. Mm. How many times, Mrs. Fink? Uh, I don't know, Captain. Five, six, maybe seven. I didn't wait to count. Would you know this boy again? Oh, yeah, Captain. Always I will know him. All right, uh, just a minute. Uh, Drake. Yes, sir. Uh, come here, will you? What is it, sir? Uh, get Bob Williams. Right. Now, uh, <clears throat> Mrs. Fink, we're going to bring a young man in here. I want to impress upon you the importance of this identification. I want you to look at him carefully. Notice the way he's dressed and everything about him. And then tell me if he's the man you saw firing the gun. All right, Captain. All right. Uh, stand right over here, please. There. Yes. Now, Mrs. Fink. Uh, that's him. Sure, that's him. You, uh, couldn't be mistaken? No, Captain. Not in a million years. All right. Take him out, Drake. Paul, well, send the other boy in. All right. Now, <clears throat> you're, uh, sure that that was the boy, are you, Mrs. Fink? Yes, Captain. Mm -hmm. Is this the man? Uh, no. Well, what do you think? Is this the man, Mrs. Fink? Uh, yes. Why didn't the officer just take out the other man? Yeah, you're positive in your identification, are you? Yes, Captain. But I don't see. 
Harold. Thank you for coming down. We will try not to bother you anymore until the trial. Uh, sure, out, Drake. Uh, thank you, Captain. Uh, let me see. You're uh, Bob Williams, aren't you? Yes. Now, listen, lad. We want you to help us. You're not going to get much for this killing if you get anything at all. But we've got to arrest you and bring you to trial. Or, that is, whichever one of you kills Savoldi. Now, uh, tell me, Bob, which one of you killed him? Frank killed him. Where were you? At home in the basement. Anybody see you there? No. No one saw me until Frank came in at 4 o'clock. Uh, what did you do then? Well, I helped him clean the fingerprints off a revolver. I see. Uh, bring Frank in, Drake. Right, Captain. Come in, kid. Now, Frank, uh, Bob here has just told us that uh, you killed Savoli. I killed him? Yes, didn't you? Bob's crazy. He killed him. Oh, uh, where were you at the time? At home in the basement. Anybody see you there? No. How long were you there? Until Bob came in at 4 o'clock. Uh, and uh, what did you do then? I helped him clean the fingerprints off a revolver. I see. Huh. Well, uh, you, uh, you boys go home until I figure this thing out. Now... Uh, let me ask you again. Did you kill Savoli, Frank? No. Bob killed him. Mm-hmm. Did you kill Savoli, Bob? Frank's crazy. He killed him. Mm-hmm. All right, boys. Uh, give me some time to think out this. Thank you, Captain. Thank you, Captain. <clears throat> you know something, Drake? What's that, sir? It just occurred to me that the district attorney is going to have a tough time making a charge stick against either of those boys. Only one of them was at the scene of the crime. Therefore... We can only accuse one of them. The only witness we have can't tell which one of them did it. They both turn state's evidence against the other, so we can't charge them with conspiracy to defeat the law. And the law says we can't charge but one of them with a murder. So there you are. <laughs> it's uh, up to the D.A. Huh? What are you looking at, Drake? Eh, just looking at those two kids through the window here, Captain. They're walking along arm in arm like they didn't have a care in the world. And what's more, they haven't. Yes, sir? That's one for the book, sir.
Police headquarters. I'm sorry, Lieutenant Owens is on special duty tonight at the Ritz Hotel. Police headquarters. Hello, Lieutenant. I see the thrillers have got you working for him tonight, too. Yeah, hello, Mullen. How's the boy? Okay, Lieutenant. How's things down at headquarters? Oh, about the same, Mullen. How's it with you? Oh, one of these hotel dig jobs is a cinch, Lieutenant. I'd rather be back in the riot squad. <laughs> if I don't have some excitement on this job before long, I'll make the commissioner put me back in the old job again. <laughs> eh, you'll soon get your fill of it. This is your speed, Tim. Watching for a jewel snatcher at a swell party. Uh, yeah? Come on, Tim, spill it. What's the matter? Uh, nothing except the hotel tells me to roam around in this affair, keep my eyes open so none of these swells don't lose their sparklers. And this guy, Van de Grist, comes up to me and he says, the help is supposed to stand over by the door. <laughs> well, I can see what burns you up, Tim. I ain't got no use for guys like that living on his wife's money. <laughs> Now, what are you doing here tonight, Lieutenant? Uh, Mrs. Vandergrift called the commissioner this afternoon and requested someone from the detective bureau to look over the party this evening. Evidently, she wasn't impressed by the hotel protection. Uh, I never seen the day I couldn't handle something that would take ten of you punks to take care of. <laughs> hey, hey, where's that scream from? Oh, over there with the problem. Come on. Hey, let, let, let us through here. Will you pardon us, please? Now, what happened over here? My wife has fainted. Uh, well, what caused her to scream? I don't know. I was... Oh, my brooch! My diamond brooch! It's gone! Uh, who took it? Oh, I don't know. I was standing over there. But, but Martha, he... perhaps you dropped it. Now, wait a minute, Mr. Vandegris. Let's uh, let your wife tell her story. Go ahead, ma'am. Well, I, I was standing over there by that curtain, showing the brooch to some friends. I had just pinned it onto my dress when a hand reached out from behind that curtain and tore it loose. See? My dress is torn right here in front. I see. But, Martha, was you... Was it a very valuable pin, ma'am? Not so terribly valuable, officer. I value it more as an heirloom. How much would it cost to replace it? Oh, I don't suppose it'd be more than a, worth more than a thousand dollars. And that uh, string of pearls you're wearing, ma'am, uh, what are they worth? Well, you, you embarrass me in front of all these people, officer. I'm sorry, ma'am. I had a special reason in asking that question. Well, they cost me... Oh, that is Henry... Oh, ten thousand dollars. And the thief made no attempt to grab them? No, officer. I, I can't understand it. Well, maybe I can. Uh, will you show us just where you were standing, ma'am? Come along, Lieutenant. I got some ideas, and I'd like to see what you think of them. All right, Tim. Now, I uh, I was standing right uh, right here. And the thief reached out from behind this curtain? Uh, yes. And uh, did you get a look at his face? No, I didn't. I just saw his hand. It seemed to be clutching at my throat. I screamed, and, and then I, I must have fainted. Now, well, ma'am, you get back to your party and let us work on this thing. There's no cause for any excitement, and if any of your guests feel uh, uneasy, they can they can put their valuables in the hotel safe. Very well, officer. You've been very kind. Oh, and I do hope that you'll be able to recover the pin. You see, I was going to give it to my niece for her graduation. Oh, you were uh, going to give it to your niece? Yes. You see, she has always admired the pin. And... Well, you just uh, let us work now, ma'am. We'll have a report for you before the party breaks up. Thank you, officer. Oh, dear, I, I feel so trembly. Henry! Henry, Mom! Well, you took the investigation right out of my hands, Tim. I just wanted to show you, Tim, that even though I'm retired, I'm still as good as any of you boys. <laughs> All right. You've been off a chunk of trouble. And we'll let you handle this case, and if you run up against the wall, don't come running to headquarters. Don't worry. Come on. Well, what are you going to do? I'm going to find that dame's diamond pin. <laughs> what do you expect to find behind those curtains? Dust. You see, I know the employees of this hotel better than you do, Lieutenant. They wouldn't think of dusting behind the curtains in a million years. Huh. What is it? Just what I thought. You see this radiator? Yeah. There's a cover on it. This cover probably hasn't been dusted since it was put on. Well, what's that got to do with it? Just this. This jewel snatcher, whoever he was, was hiding behind this curtain. He probably had to wait quite a while until someone come near enough to let him grab a sparkler and scram by these back stairs. All right. He'd probably get tired standing, so he looked for a place to sit down. Right. You see that spot in the dust? That's where the guy sat while he was waiting. Oh, I see what you're up to. You're going to line up the gentleman guests and ask them to lift their coattails. The one that has dust on the seat of his trousers is going to be clapped in the jug, huh? All right. Now, stop razzing me, Lieutenant. You know as well as I do that none of these swells pull that job. Why, they're all wearing more jewelry than Mrs. Vandergrift lost. Oh, what's so significant about the dust? Nothing, except that to uh, hoist himself up here on this radiator cover, the guy we're after had to use his hands. You put Raz and me and take a close look at this cover, you'll see prints of both hands. Perfect prints. Just what we need. Oh. Hey, Joe, you're right, Mullen. I beg your pardon. For what? I mean, uh, excuse me. Uh, have you gentlemen uh, uh, found anything? You're darn right. We just the same as found the life history and picture of the guy who stole your wife's pin. Hey, stay away from those prints. What are you trying to do? Smear them up? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, get a fingerprint man from headquarters to check these up, Lieutenant, while I stay here and sort of look after him. I got a hunch that these prints will tell us everything we want to know. Well, what's the dope? 
moping, huh? Well, the prints belong to gentleman Jim Bradley. Gentleman Jim, huh? When did he get out of the big house? Mm, the first of last month. I suppose you put out an order to pick him up. They'll have him by morning. Oh? Yeah. yeah, this is a hotel detective. Huh? Huh? Uh, all right, I'll be right down. So what is it? I guess I'm getting what I asked for tonight. One of the guests just took a header out of a 14-story window. Come on. Who was it? I didn't know. Let's, uh, let's take these stairs. They will shoot us right out onto the street. Yeah, right here. Yeah, all right, open up here. Let us serve, will you? Come on, get back. Holy smoke, Lieutenant, look. Gentlemen, Jim Bradley. Yeah, and it wasn't much of a job to find him. Well, there's one jailbird who'll never fly again. Come on, let's search him for the diamond. Oh, you're crazy as a loon, Tim. What do you expect to find in here? Well, if Bradley didn't have the diamond on him, it's probably in his room here. Shut the door. I'm beginning to believe that he isn't the man we're after. Now, how about the fingerprint? Sure he is. Say, that's funny. What? This uh, slipper up here. Oh, what's funny about that? We found the other one in the street. Yeah, but I was thinking... Say, gentleman Jim didn't suicide. That's where I've been wrong. Why, if he'd have jumped out, uh, we'd have found both slippers in the street. But if he'd been hit on the head and tossed out, one of the slippers could have easily come off while the killer was dragging his body to the window. Quick, get Tommy Woods on that phone for me, will you? What do you want Tommy for? Now, Tommy knows more about what goes on in this town between midnight and morning than the town itself. When you get him, I'll talk to him. And then you chase down to room 826 and get Saul Levinson out of bed. He'll yell his head off, but get him up here. I've got a job for him. All right, Tim. You got me all mixed up, but it's your case. Yeah, just do as I say, that's all. I think I'll have an arrest for you. Okay. Well, thanks, Tommy. Yeah, you've told me all I need to know. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think we've got a pretty good case on him. I'll let you know. Come in. So what's the big idea, Tim? Here I am sleeping soundly, and this guy breaks in and says you want to see me. So what's the idea, huh? Yeah, you'll find out. You're the best diamond expert in town, so all I want your advice on something. At 12 o'clock at night, three, I'm going back to bed. Oh, no, you're not. You wait here. Yeah, that'll be Mr. Vandergrist. I sent a boy to ask him to come down. Now, open the door, Lieutenant. Uh, did someone... Uh... Oh, yes, yeah. come on in, Mr. Vandegrist. Uh, we want to talk to you. But my wife is giving a party. I, I uh, really should This ain't according to law, Vandegrist. Uh, but... Yeah, what was the idea? Yeah, what... search him out. You can't uh, do this while uh, you blackguard, you ruffians. I, well, I... I'll be a monkey's uncle. Yeah, you found it, did you? Yeah. Here. Uh, that's the diamond pin, all right. You can't do this. It's a uh, poor time to be telling us. Here, take a look at this rock saw. What's it worth? Well, it's a pretty nice setting. Of him, I'd say twenty dollars. His wife claims it's worth one grand. It might be if it was real. Yeah, I'll call my lawyer and he'll... Yeah, yeah, you won't call nobody until we tell you you can. Where'd you get this rock? I won't say a thing until I see my lawyer. All right, I'll tell you. You lead a pretty wild life, Andergrist. You haven't got a dime of your own. You spend what your wife gives you, but uh, that isn't enough for the kind of party you fling. So you hire gentleman Jim Bradley to steal your wife's diamond pin. Now, you're going to stay locked in this room until we make a little visit upstairs. I'm not. I tell you, I'm not. No? Uh, come on, boys. Well, maybe you know what you're up to, but you're liable to get in an awful jam. Who lives there? The Vandergrist. They got nearly the entire wing. I wish you'd tell me what this is all about. I'm sorry to disturb you, Miss Vandergrist, but uh, we just received word that all your jewels have been stolen out of your safe. Why, well, I'm sure that they haven't. I was just... I wonder if uh, you'd mind looking again, ma'am. Why, certainly not. Come in. The safe's right over here. Oh, but I'm sure there must be some mistake. You see? They're all here. Everything. Yeah, I see this diamond necklace. Why, yes. Yeah, take a look at it, Saul. What's it worth? Mm, Fifty dollars. Fifty dollars? Why, I'll have you know yeah, that... Paste, lady. Paste? Look at this other stuff, Saul. Hmm. Uh-huh. Same thing. Hey. What? Mrs. Vandergrist, I'm sorry to tell you, but your jewels have been stolen. And to uh, keep you from finding it out, these imitation stones were replaced in the original sentence. Now, if you'll lend us your cooperation, I think we'll be able to apprehend the criminal. What? What do you want me to do? Just sign this complaint here. We'll do the rest. Well, I really should consult my husband. I don't believe that's necessary, ma'am. Well? There. Yeah, thank you, ma'am. We'll uh, have some news for you within an hour. 
Tim, what in heaven's name are you up to? So I'm too old to be in the force, huh? <laughs> you young punks that have had a swell time with this case. Oh, I haven't got it straight yet. Yeah, easy. This guy, Van der Grist, needed money. His wife wouldn't give him any more, so he's been steadily stealing her jewels and replacing them with imitations. But why did he have gentleman Jim Bradley steal the pin if it was worthless? And because his wife was going to give it to her niece. The niece would have probably discovered the imitation and told the old lady. Yeah, but why did Vanderbilt shove gentleman Jim Bradley out of the window? Uh, it'll be hard to prove that, but he he knew that we'd get Bradley sooner or later and that Bradley would squeal. Well, come on, Lieutenant. There's work to be done. Say, officer, please, can I go to bed? the police, ma'am? Yes, I called. What's wrong? Well, there's an awful smell of gas coming up to my room. Where? Right here. I run the room and house, and all morning long I've been smelling gas. Can't seem to find out where it's coming from. Why didn't you call the gas company? Because I want you to look into old Dad Higgins' tailor shop. I'd be coming from there, and I don't see Dad up and about. All right. Come on, Mac. Let's see if we can find where the gas is coming from. Right. I never knew Dad Higgins to be so late getting up. He's usually up long before this. Always seems sitting in the window there when I go to the store. Is this the, the door to his place? Uh, yes, and my rooms are right upstairs. Old Duffer must be out. Yeah, this is where the gas is coming from, all right, Mac. Yeah, it smells like it. Say, what? What's in the chair there in the back room? Where? Why, that's him. That's Mr. Higgins. In there and all that gas. All right, give me a hand here. Right. Uh, uh, no, I won't budge. Stand back. Uh. All right, come on. Hey, look out for the gas, Ed. <coughs> Use your handkerchief. <laughs> come on, we got to get this old man out of here. <coughs> Where's the gas coming from? That stove, probably. <coughs> shut it off. Okay. Better shut it off at the pipe. There. <coughs> All right, now give me a hand here. All right, here we go. 
Oh, well, you better carry him right out on the street. Yeah. <coughs> <laughs> All right, don't crowd in around here. Open up. Just lay him down on the sidewalk, Ed. Some of you rubbernecks are going to call into the fire department. We we'll need an inhalator. Hurry it up. How's he look, Ed? He uh, looks like a goner. Body's cold. Maybe like in circulation. Here, I'll work his lungs. See if you can find some water. All right, I'll be right back. But you're wasting your time. All right, move on. This doesn't concern you. All right, back there. Stand back. <laughs> He's working on him any longer. He was dead when we carried him out. What do you stay with him until the ambulance comes? Okay. Come on, Max. So where are you going? Inside the store and look around. It's had time to tear out, I guess. Yeah. Gas makes me feel sick. Poor old fellow. Probably down in the mouth and blue. Well, I have to get pretty despondent to do a thing like that. Yeah. All right, be careful of the glass here. You better shut what's left of the door to keep that crowd of rubbernecks out. Phew, <coughs> there's plenty left here. <coughs> Maybe you better open one of those windows and let some fresh air in. Okay. Oh, wait a minute. I guess you better leave him alone until the lieutenant gets here. You know how he yells when we disturb anything. Yeah. Hey, what's that over there on the table? Huh? I don't know. Looks like a note. Uh, it is a note. Yeah, let me see it. Life has become a burden to me. I'm getting old and have no reason to live any longer. The only one who has been kind to me is Peter Torrance. I leave him all I have. Signed, Dad Higgins. Well, I guess that settles that. Yeah, I guess so. We broke in on him here. I had a feeling that maybe everything wasn't on the level, but I guess that note settles everything. Well, anyway, it's the lieutenant's job to investigate these cases. Our job is riding around looking them up for him. Uh, who's that, the lieutenant? No, it's Burke. Uh, where's the lieutenant, Burke? That's called out on a murder. Sent me over to tell you boys to handle this yourself. Make a full report before you have the radio put you back in service. Uh... What happened? Uh, some old man got tired of living and bumped himself off. Uh, Took gas. That must have been him I saw him carting out in the general hospital ambulance when I drove up. Yeah. Well, you got the lieutenant's message. I'm going home and get some sleep. I was up all night making fingerprints off a hotel safe only to find out that the clerk himself took the dough. Well, I'll be seeing you. Hey, wait a minute, Burke. What do you want? Have you got your fingerprint outfit with you? Yeah, but... Hey, uh, I, I wonder if you'd uh, see what you can find on that gas valve there. Hey, I'm due at home. I'm just, I, uh... just take a minute or so. I don't think that there's anything wrong here, and if if you find old Dad Higgins' prints on that gas valve, I'll know there's nothing wrong. Yeah, but if you think I'm going to make a trip down to the morgue to take his impressions so I can check him up, you're crazy. Now, that won't be necessary. I imagine you'll find plenty of his prints all over the place here. Try those irons on the shelf there. Hey, uh, Mac. Yeah? Will you chase upstairs and get that room and house woman who called in on the case? Yeah, sure thing. Hello, boy. Well, what'd you find, Bert? Uh, what do you think I am, a magician? Give me some time. You're worse than a lieutenant. Every time there's a suicide, he takes a prince everybody living within a five-mile <laughs> radius. <laughs> well, that's your game, isn't it? Yeah, but not taking them in droves. Yeah. And I hope you're satisfied. What'd you find? Nothing. Nothing? You heard me. The valve's as clean as a pin. One of you dummies probably smeared whatever prints were on it. And uh, that's where you're wrong. I had Ed shut it off at the pipe, not at the burner. Was the corpse wearing gloves? Of course not. No prints, huh? Yeah, that's funny. How about the door? Locked on the inside, both of them. The windows? All locked, tight in a safe. Uh, look here. Uh, dead cat. Yeah. Must have been Higgins' cat. Looks like he set some milk out for it just before he turned on the gas. Funny he'd do that. Hey, where do you think you are, Ed? On the detective detail? Well, the lieutenant said to investigate this, didn't he? Yeah, but he didn't say to go building up any hypothetical cases. Listen, Ed, when a guy gets bumped off, you got to have a motive, the means of doing the job, and a criminal. You ain't got nothing but a dead cat. Well, maybe I'll surprise you. I got a suicide note, too. And you got me wasting my time around here? Take the note to headquarters and check it suicide. I'm going home. Hey, just a minute. Would you take a look at that transom above the back door there for me? Eh, all right, but that's all. What do you want me to look for? I don't know. But if the killer... Oh, was theorizing he... again, huh? Well, if Dad Higgins was killed, that's the only place the murderer could get out after he bolted both doors from the inside. Then he could close the transom after him and snap the lock. Got it all figured out, eh? Well... What'd you find? I got to hand you for one thing, anyway. There was someone crawling over this transom recently. 
I can see where the dust's been wiped away. Any prints? No prints. Well, that's that. Thanks, Bert. I'll buy a cigar sometime. I'll probably be too old to smoke it. So long. Oh, oh pardon me, ma'am. I didn't see you. Oh, here's the lady who called us in. All right, good. Uh, what's your name, ma'am? Dugan. Mrs. Dugan. And I've been living here for... Uh, how well did you know Dad Higgins? Well, as anyone, I reckon. Uh, he didn't get about much. Uh, stayed in the shop here most of the time. Cooked and slept here, too. You know of any reason for anyone killing him? Killing him? Why, land sakes, no. Did he have any money? Well, not a lot. At least ways I don't think he had. How long has he been living here? Well, he was uh, living here when I came. Uh, that was 15 years ago. Did he have any relatives? Well, not that I know of. He used to get some letters from a sister of his, but she died a few years ago. How do you know? Well, I... Uh, how do I know what? How do you know that he used to get letters from his sister? Uh, because he, he'd bring them upstairs for me to read to him. Poor soul. Never had no education. No learning. Mm-hmm. Uh, is this his cat? Land sakes, it sure is. Oh, he was right fond of it, too. Do you think that Mr. Higgins would pour a dish of milk for the cat and then leave it in the room to die when he killed himself? No. No, I don't think he would. Mr. Higgins wasn't that kind of a man. I see. Uh, give me that note, Mac. All right. Uh, Mrs. Dugan, uh, do you know a Mr. Torrance? Peter Torrance? Sure, I know him. He's roomed with me for five years. Were he and Dad Higgins good friends? Well, now, I can't answer that. They used to talk a lot down here in the evenings. But as far as being real good friends, I don't know. Would you be surprised if you knew that Dad Higgins had left the shop and everything he had to this fellow Torrance? Well, yes, I would. Uh, here's something, Ed. What's that? I just found a savings account book on this desk. Old man Higgins had nearly $5,000 saved up in the First National. My man. Oh, he did, eh? Well, uh, thank you, Mrs. Dugan. You can get back upstairs now. Come on, Mac. Let's look around downstairs here, then. Yes. Oh, uh, it's uh, you, officer. Yes, we just finished our looking around downstairs, and we wanted to tell Mr. Torrance of his good fortune. Which room does he live in? Uh, right across the hall. Uh, that's it, at number 12. All right, thanks. Oh, uh, is he in? I don't know. Well, we'll see. Hey, what's on your mind, Ed? Wait and see. Knock on this door. Well, he's probably out. Wait. What do you want? We're officers of the law. We've got some good news for you. Oh, uh, yeah? Well, I ain't done nothing. Well, nobody said you had. Mind if we come in? No, only don't try to pin nothing on me. I'm going straight now. Yeah. Old timer, eh? Uh, I've done my bit. Well, maybe things are looking better for you, Pete. You, you knew that Dad Higgins committed suicide. Yeah, yeah, Mrs. Dugan told me. It's too bad. Not too bad for you. Look, here's a note. Dad Higgins left everything to you. Everything he had. Left me? Everything? Why? Uh, yeah, but you won't get a chance to use it. Get his arm. Say, what are you doing? All right, there. Now, put these on him. Hey, hey. There you go. Uh, thought you'd get away with it, didn't you? What are you talking about? You know what I'm talking about. You killed Dad Higgins. Huh? You throttled him with a big towel so it wouldn't leave any marks, and then you turned on the gas. You left this note so it'd look like a suicide. That's a lie. Oh, is it? You had things pretty well thought out, Torrance. You knew that the old man was alone at night. You knew that he had a savings account with almost $5,000 in it. You knew nearly everything about him except one thing. Uh, what do you mean? Why, you poor dumbbell, you slipped up just like all the other smart guys. Too bad, Torrance, when you wrote that note that you didn't know that old man Higgins never learned to read and write.
headquarters. Hold the wire, please. Detective Bureau, Captain McNeil. This is the fallen bishop, Captain. I'm at the subway terminal building. Some guy just killed a man right in front of the building and disappeared under the crowd. Evans and I gave chase but couldn't get him. Good enough. All right, phone a description into radio. I'll send Berger down to take charge. Right. What's up, Captain? Shooting in front of subway terminal. Get a couple of boys and hop them down there. Round up all the witnesses you can find and report back here. Right. Oh, uh, there's a man outside waiting to see you. What does he want? Don't know. He says he wants to see you. Oh. All right, send him in. Captain, I'll see you now. Uh, right in here. Thank you. Uh, Captain McNeil? Yes? Uh, I believe you've just had a murder reported. What about it? I feel that I might be of assistance. Our men can handle it. I see you don't understand me. What I mean, Captain, is I might be able to, what well, that is, tell you something about the case. Were you a witness? Very much so, Captain. Hmm. Come in and sit down, Mr. Uh, Shall we say uh, Brown? If you wish. Thank you, Captain. Uh, have this chair. Thank you. As you were saying, oh, now, yes. uh, I was saying that I could tell you something of interest about the murder of Andrew Adams. Adams? Yes. I believe he's known as Andrew Spicer now. Hmm. Go ahead, Mr. Brown. Do you know the man who killed him? Yes. Although I have my doubts if you'll be able to do anything to him. Why do you say that? The answer to that is a long story, Captain. A story you will find hard to believe. But, as I say, the police will find it very difficult to punish the murderer. <coughs> John Fleming thought things out very carefully before he killed Andrew Adams. Would you like to hear the whole story? I would. Very well. <coughs> John Fleming, the man who killed Adams, is a rather small man, much the same build as myself. He is no longer young. Years have put their mark on him. Only two months ago, he was released from Stonehill Prison. Oh, ex man. Huh? Good. We'll have a complete line on him. Yeah, I think he realizes that. But to continue with my story, John Fleming was a hard-working farmer before his... his misfortune. He was well thought of in the community, well liked by everyone except one man, a neighbor of Fleming's. This man hated Fleming, and Fleming returned that hatred... One morning, a neighbor's body was found in the burned ruins of his home. Two bullets were found embedded in the body, and those bullets were traced to the gun of John Fleming. Needless to say, after a trial by jury, John Fleming was called to face the bar of justice. Yeah, well, order! Order in the court! Gentlemen of the jury, have you reached a verdict? We have, Your Honor. Will you read that verdict? We find the defendant, John Fleming, guilty of second-degree murder as charged, with a recommendation for mercy. Second-degree murder. Order! Order! John Fleming, will you rise and face the court? You have been duly tried and convicted on a charge of murder in the second degree. The jury has handed the court a recommendation for mercy. Is there anything you wish to say before a sentence is passed upon you? Nothing, Your Honor, other than to once again maintain that I am innocent of this crime. On the witness stand, I readily admitted the enmity between the deceased and myself, however. I did not kill him. That is all I have to say. John Fleming, it is the order of this court that you be taken to the state prison at Stonehill... And there be imprisoned for a term not to exceed 20 years. 20 years. So, John Fleming was convicted of a crime which he strongly maintained he did not commit. I see. But where does all where this, does this uh, connect with your case? I'm coming to that, Captain. John Fleming served 18 years, two months, and three days of that sentence. At noon on the last day of his confinement, he was called into the office of the warden. The warden was busy. Oh, come in, Fleming. Uh, you wanted to see me, warden? Yes. Uh, sit down. Thank you, sir. Today is the big day for you, Fleming. Yes, I, I know, sir. Today you become a free man. Today your debt to society is paid. Paid in full. 
You've been a model prisoner, Fleming. Your work in our agricultural department will long be remembered. I'm sorry to see you go, but I trust you'll not be back. No, sir. Before you leave, there's one question I'd like to ask you. It's caused me great concern since I assume my duties here as warden. How do you feel about your conviction now? I am not guilty of the crime with which I was charged and convicted. I see. Well, you're free, Fleming. Free to go, and may you enjoy the best of luck. Here's my hand. And so, Captain, John Fleming walked out between the great iron gates of the prison alone. He had a cheap suit of clothes on his back and twelve dollars in his pocket. Yet he resolved to start life anew. Start where he left off. I don't know just what you're leading up to, Mr. Brown, but you'll have to hurry your story. We've work to do in this apartment. I won't take up much more of your time, Captain. I... <coughs> well, Fleming tried to find work. You have my word for that. But luck just didn't break for him. Finally, he came back here to his hometown. No one recognized him. He found a job in a trucking company. It was hard work for an old man. Each evening, he dragged himself home utterly exhausted from the day's work. One evening, he opened the door to his room and found... Good evening, Fleming. Adams. You... You... Alive. <laughs> oh, yes, I'm very much alive. Don't stand there staring. Come in. But I... I know you were told I was dead. You were convicted for my murder. You slaved 18 years for it, not knowing that it was alive and prospering. <laughs> you mean that... I mean you were framed, Fleming. Framed by me. I caused you to suffer in that living hell for 18 years because you married the woman I love. But Mary... Is... Yes, I know. Your wife died during the second year of your imprisonment. But no matter. I've had my revenge. I wanted to see you suffer. I wanted to see you in agony, even though it meant burning my home and leaving town for 15 years. Oh, you... You fiend, i Be careful, Fleming. I have a gun. I wouldn't hesitate to kill you like I would a dog. I thought perhaps the hardship of prison life would do it for me, but you were too hardy. Never mind. You're dying. Your face shows it. Every movement of your body shows it. And you came up here to gloat over it, to enjoy my misery. Andrew Adams, I'll... You can't do anything. Andrew Adams is dead. My name is Spicer. I'm a well-to-do merchant. Nobody would believe you. But the body. A body which the authority mistook for mine. <laughs> oh, I planned things carefully, my friend. I stole your gun in your absence. The body was that of a tramp who came to my house begging food. I shot him with your gun. Poured oil on my house and disappeared. You can imagine what joy I had reading of your arrest and conviction. Oh, you, you... <coughs> You haven't long to live, Fleming. I had intended killing you, but I've changed my mind. I shall let you suffer, suffer the knowledge that I, Andrew Adams, wrecked your life as you tried to wreck mine. But I didn't. Oh, I shall leave you now. Leave you in your misery, Fleming. Leave you to ponder on the wreckage you have made of things. You haven't long to live, Fleming. <laughs> I can see that you're becoming interested, Captain. We come now to the last scene of this story. John Fleming was left alone to think things out. Prison had dulled his senses. It took him several days to map out his course. Then Fleming took what little money he'd saved and purchased a revolver. Next, he made arrangements to meet Adams at a downtown building. He was waiting when Adams arrived. <laughs> had the nerve to call on me for help, did you? Oh, do you think I'd help you? Do you think I'll give you one cent for doctors or medicine? I didn't come to you for aid, Adams. <coughs> I came to talk things over with you. Talk things over? What do I have to talk to you about? Several things, I believe. <coughs> First, I want to compliment you upon the planning and executing of such a diabolical scheme to wreak vengeance upon a fellow man. It was a bit of planning as only the devil himself could have accomplished. You have anything to say to me? Oh, you're a smart man, Adams. 
You knew exactly what you were doing. You knew that I'd be arrested and convicted for a crime which I did not commit. I believe the irony of the thing amused you. You knew just how everything would happen. You thought it all out in great detail. But there's one thing that you overlooked. I didn't. Oh, yes, you did, Adams. You overlooked the fact that a man can only pay once for the same crime. Once and once only. I've paid for your murder, Adams. Now I'm going to... No, no, no. You won't. Where can I find this Fleming? Why do you want to bother him, Captain? You, you can't convict him. I'm not so sure of that. He's already paid for the crime. Paid in full. He can't be made to pay again. Yes, but it's not up to me. I'll have to arrest him. Arrest him for the murder of a dead man. Uh, very well, Captain. I'm John Fleming. Uh-huh.